Bhutan, home of this horse that came up when I typed Bhutan into a stock footage site. But if you fly to Bhutan to meet him, beware, landing at their one international airport is notoriously difficult. Only a laughably small number of pilots are allowed to attempt the approach. We put 24 in the title, but that's the most generous figure. Many places cite it lower, but we couldn't confirm a number before it was writer recess time, so we went with 24 to be safe. But what makes landing at Paro International Airport so hard, and how do those pilots pull it off? Let's start by walking through a chill, unremarkable approach to a chill, unremarkable airport we'll call, um, half as airport. As you're coming in, you can see the runway from about 10 nautical miles off. Like most commercial airports these days, Hafez Airport has an instrument landing system, or ILS, that guides your approach with the help of two radio beacons. The localizer, whose signal tells you how far off the center you are in the horizontal direction, and a glide slope, which tells you the same for the vertical. There are a handful of other beep boops and tools that keep you on track, and while the ILS doesn't land the plane for you, it removes enough opportunities for pilot error that you can land at Hafez Airport in bad weather, at night, with turbulence, basically any unremarkable conditions. If you're a captain, training to land at Hafez Airport basically means reading about it. Contrast that with Paro, whose six-step process involves training in a simulator, a classroom, and the air, plus 30 supervised takeoffs and landings. And that's if you're already a captain. If you're new to flying, getting released to fly in and out of Paro can take a year, because the approach is sort of like half as airports, but with a ton of obstacles, a steeper descent, and a zigzaggy path, plus a higher elevation and the weird air that brings. Oh, also take that 10 nautical miles of runway visibility and make it one or two, and then, just for spice, toss the ILS and instead rely on your eyes. You know, the things that can't decide if this is a duck or a rabbit, even though it's clearly an alien eating a sandwich. To give you a perfect explanation of this landing, I'd have to send my writer Amy to a year of flight school in Bhutan, which I won't because I'm a bad feminist. So I told her to just look it up, which was going well until she saw this, then she had a bit of a meltdown and read way too much, then called her cousin to explain some charts because that's what cousins are for, and here's what she got. The Paro Airport has a Paro Approaches, which is to say you can land on its lone runway in either of these directions. That runway is just 7,431 feet long, or about 2,265 meters, which is also about how high the Paraport is above sea level. It's a little short for a typical commercial runway, and a lot short for an airport at that altitude, where planes take longer to gather enough speed for takeoff. That means that both takeoffs and landings from Paro have to be exceptionally precise, despite tons of obstacles. And by tons, I mean 107, helpfully laid out on this chart. Tag yourself, I'm this antenna tower. You may notice that a lot of these obstacles are just terrain, which is thanks to a bunch of mountains, some of which are over 16,000 feet or 5,000 meters high, taller than Mount Fuji, the Matterhorn, or me. You need to do a lot of twisty turnsy to not hit any of said mountains, which is why the approach looks like this instead of this. Each of these little star things is a waypoint, a visual cue you need to fly by at a certain altitude to know you're on the right track. I can't tell you exactly what all these waypoints represent, because that's stuff Amy would have learned in Bhutanese flight school, where I won't send her, probably because I hate her, but here are two key ones. The first is here, the bridge over the confluence of Paro Chu and Thimphu Chu, which you should fly over at about 12,000 feet or 3,600 meters. From there, you descend through the valley, dodging obstacles and not flying over yellow rooftops because those are sacred sites. Eventually, you'll see this last ridge line. You have to make a tight turn around it, and once you do, you can finally see the runway for the roughly 30 seconds between completing the turn and touching down. And remember, the only piece of equipment outside the aircraft helping you is a single VOR that tells you the radial line of position between you and the airport, which isn't nothing, but is close. It's sort of like the difference between getting to your friend's house with Google Maps and getting to your friend's house by screaming Marco and heading in the general direction of Polo. So to maintain terrain separation, which is pilot speak for not crashing, all you've got is your eyes. That's why you're not even allowed to attempt a night landing at Paro, let alone one in bad weather. The mountains bring a ton of wind, meaning tons of turbulence, which makes the landing even tougher. So in the windiest times, i.e. afternoons from February to May, you can't do it in the afternoons either. A safe and successful landing at Paro demands nothing short of perfection. Perfect weather, perfect visibility, and a perfect pilot. It's the aviation equivalent of landing a quadruple axle, or making a croquembouche, or sealing the Declaration of Independence. Near impossible, even for the best in the game. So as small a number as it is, it's kind of amazing that even people know how to do it. And if you want to be one of those people, cool, I won't help. When you fly into Paro, it's kind of a close shave. But you know what's really a close shave? Any shave involving our new sponsor, Henson Shaving. I'm really excited about this one because I'm a big believer in their product. Henson makes safety razors, you know, those old school single blade ones. And they've really nailed the engineering. 
The blade sticks out less than the width of a hair. The blade's supported all the way through. It looks cool. All this to give you the safest, smoothest, closest shave of your life. I can definitely say that for me personally, I'd always use electric razors since I couldn't find a manual one that wouldn't irritate my skin, but Henson is literally the only exception. Apparently most razors don't support the blade enough, which causes them to flex and vibrate against the skin, causing irritation, but Henson's doesn't, meaning I can finally get a close shave without regretting it after. And the best part? You don't need to replace it every few weeks like those disposable plastic grocery store things. Your one Henson razor will last you for decades. You just need to replace the blades, which cost about 10 cents a pop. So while the razor is a bit of an investment up front, it starts saving you money in just a few months, depending on how often you shave. So if you're ready for a better shave, go to hensonshaving.com com slash HAI and enter HAI at checkout to get 100 free blades with your purchase. Make sure you have both the razor and the blades in your cart to get the deal.